Welcome, listeners, to www.ironradio.org, the website and podcast for all things strength sports and sports nutrition. With your hosts, Lonnie Lowry. Remember, Phil is like a gnarled old oak tree held together with scar tissue and bone spurs. Rob Fortney. And I'm telling you, the pain that I would suffer was ex- beyond excruciating. And Phil Stevens. Do it, Rob. You'll kill all those nerves. Thanks for listening. Welcome, Iron Radio listeners. This is Lonnie Lowry. I'm an exercise physiology and nutrition professor of about 20 years now, uh, and I'm a former competitive bodybuilder. I am running solo this morning. Uh, Mike Nelson, Dr. Nelson, is on a flight literally as we speak, so that's the only thing that really keeps him from being on the show is if he's in the air, so he can't really do this at 30,000 feet. Phil is giving a seminar. Now, Phil said he would like to get me some material, so I'm going to cut away right now, and we're going to uh, get some uh, input from Phil. Uh, when we come back, we have a quite a bit of news set up here. It's almost going to be like Anchorman Dr. Lowry here, but we got news, both science and industry, fitness industry type news, uh, some mail, and the topic is going to be developing big arms, uh, making stubborn arms grow. I thought I would take the opportunity to do this since... Uh, Phil's away, and um, you know this is my bias, but I think a lot of powerlifters, some of them don't even do direct arm work. Uh, now, if you do, if you're a powerlifter, that's that's great. But we're going to talk about arms specifically uh, as a body part, and to me, that's a little bit more bodybuilding flavored. But I digress. Let's cut over to Phil, uh, and then we'll get back to the regular show. Hey, everybody, Phil here. I'm reaching out to you again. I'm on the uh, kind of on the road. So I'm, I'm recording something. So anyways, this is Phil Stevens. Uh, I run Strength Field. I'm a powerlifter. I'm a games athlete. Just thinking about this this morning. I've been at this, uh, we'll call it like 16 years. Because that's 16 years ago is when I was hired. So I don't consider what I was doing before that coaching. Um, but anyways, so longer than that. But competitive athlete for much longer. Anyways, so reaching out to you. It's my birthday week. And one of the things I wanted to do was get back on the seminar field. So I got a seminar today with my buddy John Harris, and I was just sitting here thinking of what I'd talk about and I'm going to hit one of the points that I'm going to hit in my seminar that uh, actually goes right and melds into John's wheelhouse that he will have a lot to say about too but uh, maybe you guys come out to one of these one of these days it's all about uh, our seminar is building the 10 year athlete it's one thing that I believe in um, I'm, I'm in it for building people over the long term and you know, and injury free or relatively injury free, um, you get to the high, high uh, levels of athletics, and there's always nings and nicks, and you're always uh, kind of walking that fine line between between injured and not, and you start working around with massive loads, and uh, it happens. But as relatively injury free as we can, and building people over the long term. So, um, and one of the things that came to mind that I thought would be good to work on or to speak of here would be uh you gotta be interested in moving efficiently that is one of my top things on my uh list of things to talk about and that's one the one john will address almost totally in his his talk john is a pt that i work with closely with a lot of my athletes if we have issues um and you know rule number one as a strength coach and as somebody who's doing programming whatever you want to call yourself a personal trainer strength coach whatever is do no harm So tied to that is that means the first thing that I feel you should do um, before any loading comes on is teach these people how to move correctly. If you can't move correctly, the probability of doing harm is going to be greater. So um, in turn with that, though, strength in and of itself can help you move better in in many instances. So um, that's kind of an interesting point. How we how do we address that? Um, We'll have to go into that more later at a time but I mean let's say somebody doesn't have enough they're squatting and they don't have the glute strength or maybe it's neural to keep their knees from caving in things like that how do we address that how would you you know how do we do a workaround so this is where we go into smaller moves things like that addressing weak points um, maybe they're just doing hip circle work you know sidewalks uh, ladder drills things like that but uh, our, our first goal, number one, is teach them how to move correctly. Um, 
and then you get in get them moving correctly and make them strong and this in of itself will prevent future harm you know, kind of like we talked about before it goes right into the do no harm uh, and then on my next on the list here is first do it right then do it hard I'm getting ready to do a talk for the schools here one of the schools is paying me to come up to uh, evaluate their programming and I can tell you one of the first things I'm going to say to these people is I'm going to talk to the, the whole school board here this summer too and one of the things I'll probably piss them all off with is they're all doing it wrong I've worked with a kid at least one kid from every school here and not one of them knows what the hell they're doing um, and they haven't been taught how to do it so that's a bad thing um, I think at this level let's talk about schools it's uh, junior high I think those two years they're in there three years now I guess it's sixth seventh and eighth should be nothing but learn how to do it right forget how much is on the bar let's get them squatting right let's get them moving right it's just three years they're freaking 11 12 years old let's teach them how to move right if you took those three years and had them perfect form had somebody in there that knew what the hell they were doing then by the time they go to high school as a freshman now you can start loading them because they've got three years of doing it right or god i hope they're doing it right after three years so two three times a week um so yeah do it right don't train until you get it right is another big one train until you can't get it wrong i posted that not long ago i think it's a great uh, just a, a great quote um we're always striving for, for, for perfection when we're training every single rep is evaluated um i expect my athletes to evaluate themselves you know they have to feel it because there's sometimes you can't sometimes the, the mishap is so so small that a, a coach can't see it and so i expect my athletes to learn themselves over time feel every single rep if something went wrong fix it on rep two if something went wrong if it's rep two fix it on rep three whatever it is um if you can't fix it let's say i do a rep something was off my back caved you know my, my thoracic gave a little bit i fix that on the next rep if that happens again i call the set i come back to it i rest mentally cue myself get ready okay let's do it right i'd rather see somebody cut a set at three that's done wrong than a set of ten that looks like crap because then again we're, we're verging into that doing harm instead of doing no harm. Um, I kind of touched on this before, but sometimes we need more basic strength to move correctly. Mobility versus flexibility. There's a big difference. Mobility and flexibility are, are a little bit related, but uh, being mobile uh, requires strength. Being flexible requires that you're stretchy. Um, there's plenty of people out there that can tie themselves into a pretzel but if you ask them to move on a field as an athlete, uh, they don't have the capacity. They don't have the strength to do some of the moves we required. Let's say somebody's really flexible. I put the 135 on their back and ask them to squat. Uh, they do it horribly, of course, because they're, they're flexible. They're, they're, they're more than flexible enough to hit the positions required. They don't have the strength to hold the positions required. So part of mobility is also holding positions, not just you know bending into positions so having the core strength the hip strength the glute strength to hit proper positions against an external load so that's one thing we'll touch on too um, move correctly then move dynamically uh, speed kills in sports I teach all my athletes I don't think there's any sports that I uh, can think of that you know moving slow is a good thing um, in the long run Moving slow at the beginning while you're learning and mastering a movement pattern is, is excellent. And then once we master that movement pattern, we start cranking up the speed. Um, when we're going for max squats and we're going for max deadlifts, we're going for max bench press, whatever, max clean and jerk, it's never a slow movement. Um, clean and jerk, for instance, has a there is a slower first pull, but that's to hit the correct position, and then we have strength to hit the, the, the faster second, third pulls. So um, once we master that movement, now we start moving faster we move my dynamically um, every warm-up in all my squats and I try and get all my people to do this in every rep of every set honestly is moving fast we're looking to crush the load make it as easy as possible again it goes back to my I'd rather see uh, I'd rather see three good reps than than ten crappy ones at any single load I would rather see an athlete just crush three reps rack it rest crush three reps again do that three times plus one to get their ten than I would three slow ugly ground or ten slow ugly grinding reps um, teach yourself to be fast at all times how to exert force against an external load <clears throat> even exert force against space um, some of my athletes that are field athletes things like that uh, doing doing drills where they're 
the running and cutting back and forth, things like that. It's just uh, speed in all sports kills, and it's learning how to brace and be dynamic in, in your whole body. So, um, in your warm ups, again, I already touched on this, but um, move correct. Only increase intensity when moving lightweight efficiently. So earn every set. I don't even, I don't have people just earn every set really. We earn every rep like I talked about. But as we're warming up, let's say I squatted yesterday. I had to get my usual Saturday training in on Friday because I have a seminar to give all day. So when I start with the bar, I don't, I don't go up to 135 until the bar feels like the bar should. Um, if I hit 135, it's like, oh, this is horrible. You know, I stay there with that until it feels what it relatively should feel like and then okay now i go up now i go two plates now i'm going to stick with two plates sometimes I, I literally might do one rep it's like oh this feels great let's go up so i hit one rep two plates let's say i get to three plates i hit one it's ah it's, that's not right so we'll stay there i might do five singles five doubles whatever at the single load okay now it's feeling right now we can go up so i would i would i would urge everybody to do that um, I see people blast through their warm-ups. And if your warm-ups look and feel like shit, there's a really good chance that your work sets are going to look and feel like shit. So, and then, again, you're, you're verging into that. Potentially doing harm. Um, you can't be strong and injured. So, I mean, number one, we, you just, as you, if you're coaching yourself or programming yourself, I urge you to have that mindset. You know, I want to get better, but I can't get better if I'm hurt. I mean, I've been hurt. <laughs> I've been hurt plenty of times. So, and this is something that I've learned. But uh, you know, most of mine were were freak little accidents. But you know, at least one of them, I could have been prevented if I wasn't just hard headed and stupid and kept pushing through pain. Uh, there's a difference that you have to learn between pain and strain, especially for new athletes. Uh, they feel very much the same, and they think straining is pain. You know, as you go along in time you learn to to recognize the difference in those there are some little nagging things that you can work through um god knows i've i've dealt with it but um you really need to id that and if you have some pain going on it's better to just i did something today i'm gonna walk away i'm gonna let this stop like yesterday i stopped my squats at 550 i did a pause squat triple at 550 my knee's kind of aching me last week I, I hit 675 so <clears throat> my knee was bugging me a tiny bit, so I uh, I decided to, to pull the trigger and uh, pull myself out and not, not squat anymore that day because I'm nine weeks out. It's better for me to pull myself now and stop at 550 there. I still got some good work in, but let that knee recover, you know, do a little mobility work on it, maybe some soft tissue work uh, myself, and come back in and then trade hard again, and we'll go from there. So... Anyways, I mean, I just wanted to touch in. I think this is a big one. I'm not huge on, and John will talk about this too, you know, huge on mobility balls and rollers and blah, blah, blah. Um, John's a PT, and of course he has to use these things to heal people. But he'll even say, if your warm-up is longer than eight minutes, you're doing something wrong. The majority of your time in the gym should be spent training. If, you, if your warm-up takes you 45 minutes and it's like, 72 variations of different ball rolls and prone grasshoppers or whatever you want to call them you're you're wasting your time and there's a reason you're not that strong you can get it warmed up in a good five to eight minutes now get yourself onto the bar i do i'm, I'm a big proponent of a direct warm-up so what do we do to warm up for our squats we do lots of squat sets to get warmed up i'll use the hip circle and warm up my hips a bit things like that maybe a couple step ups um, then I'll start squatting I mean the first thing I do is I'll just start squatting to a bench make sure I'm setting up right make sure I'm bracing my core right getting stacked and then I move to the bar um, I, I pretty quickly moved to 135 because things just don't, don't feel right for me with the bar without some load once I have some weight on there I can hit the correct positions much better and then I slowly move up and I earn my way every day and go from there so I hope that helps we'll throw some more stuff out here about the seminar I think we're planning on doing one more we film it and put this out there so I just want to say hi to everybody I'm sure Lonnie and Dr. Mike will uh, have some great stuff for you today but this is my tidbit so have a good day guys all righty we are back uh, science news we have three things that I'd like to talk about here uh, one is curcumin there's 
new uh, science about this antioxidant and anti-inflammatory type of herb, right, in curry powder and, and that sort of thing, turmeric. Uh, there's some interesting science. It's about a year old, but came across my desk for a specific reason about vitamin D. Uh, the researchers are suggesting it may be a negative, but I think for our population, we're going to spin it as a positive. Uh, and then quinoa, the grain, uh, some interesting stuff about that. So let's do the science news first before we get to the more fitness uh, in industry and iron radio stuff. Strength and muscle sport news. Okay, uh, curcumin. Curcumin may improve memory and mood, according to a new study at the University uh, of California in Los Angeles, UCLA. The research was published in the American Journal of Psychiatry. Uh, what they did was they examined the effects of it, what they say is an easily absorbed curcumin supplement on memory performance. And this is what caught my eye in people without dementia. So they were older subjects. There were, um, let's see, 40 adults. They had to be at least 50 years old, but they just had mild memory complaints. And I think a lot of us could probably uh, point to that. So uh, they took placebo or 90 milligrams of curcumin twice daily for 18 months, not 18 weeks, 18 months, a year and a half. Uh, they monitored their curcumin levels in the blood and they did PET scans, positron emission tomography scans to look at the levels of amyloid uh, plaque and tau in their brains. So these are proteins that sort of tangles that interfere with nerve function. Uh, and so they're hoping that the curcumin would reduce it. Uh, they found that people who took curcumin experienced significant improvements in memory and attention compared to the placebo group. Uh, memory improvements about 28%. So that's not just statistically significant. I think that, that has some real biological practical significance. They also had mild improvements in mood. And their brain PET scans showed significantly less amyloid and tau signals in the amygdala and the hypothalamus compared to those in the placebo group. So uh, the researchers are planning to do a larger follow-up study at this point. And again, that's interesting because Mike and I, Dr. Nelson and I, were just talking about curcumin in my cupboard. And, you know, it's just notoriously something that doesn't absorb very well. And there's a couple of different brands. Uh, now, I did pull the actual abstract. This is from Small and Colleagues. Uh, let's see. Memory and Brain Amyloid and Tau Effects of a bioavailable form of curcumin in non-demented adults, a double-blind, placebo-controlled 18-month trial. A lot of the highlights here from the journal itself uh, reflect what was in that IFT, that Institute of Food Technologists report. I like those guys because they're, they're on the ball with this stuff. Um, they did say, in fact, there were some long-term effects. The brand was Theracumin, T-H-E-R-A-C-U-R, M-I-N, Theracurmin, uh, and again, 90 milligrams twice daily. Uh, again, I have different kinds, uh, Mariva and other types of curcumin in my cupboards. A lot of the different brands uh, that are sold, they actually go to the suppliers and they look for these sort of uh, patented or special delivery systems to try to get it into your blood and indeed they talked about the specific type of pet scan etc so interesting stuff uh, you might want to consider this i know the nervous system is often a target of strength athletes right the better your nervous system works you could fire muscle tissue better potentially in that course sort of thing now this is central nervous system not peripheral so i'm just speculating there but curcumin back in the news uh, next, I said I would touch on vitamin D. Now, this paper is about a year and a half old. This is from Clinical Endocrinology Oxford 2016 by ANIC, A-N-I-C, and colleagues. Association between serum 25-hydroxy-D and serum sex steroid hormones among men in NHANES. Now, many of you know, but the NHANES is a very large. It's the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey. So imagine almost like the Google trucks that go around uh, and you know map all the streets and you can get street level information. It's sort of like that. So big mobile like labs that they go around and get their fingers on the pulse of almost literally 
of Americans with what they eat, maybe some blood work. It could be like a bone density scan or any of that sort of thing. And they, they sort of look at connections with diet from diet recalls and diet logs. Anyway, the background here, recent literature suggests that high circulating vitamin D may increase prostate cancer risk. Although the mechanism through which vitamin D may increase this risk is unknown, it could be influenced by circulating sex steroids. So what they did was they examined whether or not serum vitamin D was associated. Now, this isn't causal, right? It's just an association. There's a, they're looking for a relationship here between dietary intake of vitamin D and the amount of testosterone and uh, SHBG, sex hormone binding globulin. So the protein that sort of ties up testosterone in your blood. Um, they did, in fact, show this in the results. Uh, it says higher testosterone and higher SHBG uh, were observed with increasing amounts of vitamin D, uh, circulating vitamin D. Uh, however, and th this is where I think they're trying to spin this to make it look more dangerous than maybe it is, PSA concentration was not associated with serum 25-hydroxy-D. So, yes, you have more testosterone uh, and it's associated binding protein, but you don't have higher prostate-specific antigen. Anyway, their conclusion was... Results from these national uh, representative studies support a positive association between circulating vitamin D and testosterone and SHBG. But then they go on to say the findings support an indirect mechanism through which it may influence prostate cancer risk. Well, OK, but again, I think our listeners are going to be interested in this. Wait. This is further evidence. Now, it's epidemiology, right? It's it's not causal, but further evidence of at least one form that the higher your circulating vitamin D within a healthy range, the more testosterone you have. Um, so we've talked about this before in different intervention type studies where people were getting like 3,300 IUs of vitamin D um, daily and they, they were able to raise their low testosterone levels, things like that. So these authors suggesting it's essentially bad to put a value judgment on it. Um, and I think a lot of us would say, hey, I'll take the extra testosterone. Right, because there's lots of other things involved with prostate issues, like the amount of circulating estrogens and other things like that. So they're considering high testosterone bad, <laughs> uh, and I don't think most of us would do that. Uh, not to say that high testosterone all the time for many, many years wouldn't have some association with different bodily structures, including your prostate. But um, anyway, I thought that was worth sharing. Further evidence that vitamin D may in fact raise uh, testosterone. This last bit of nutrition news is from IFT, again, the Institute of Food Technologists, from a very recent newsletter, quinoa compounds may slow the aging process. So this is written in a little bit of what I would call commercialized language, but I'm going to try to make this more neutral and plain, but still interesting. Researchers at Rutgers University and North Carolina State University have used an unusual animal model to determine whether phytonutrients in quinoa seeds could slow the aging process. So they talk about how everybody knows you should eat more fruits and vegetables and whole grains and things like that. Again, quinoa, we're talking about a, a whole grain here. Um, a, there's a co-author of this study, Slavko Komarnitsky. And let's see, he says, quinoa contains all essential amino acids, so its protein is complete and particularly beneficial for those whose diets are low in animal protein. Now, a lot of our listeners probably not, right? Animal proteins, not just meats, but think eggs, casein, and whey, right? That's from dairy. Those are animal proteins. Uh, so this might be for someone who is a vegan listener. Um, I am really not that stoked about the protein quality. There's lots of ways to measure protein quality, uh, PER, protein efficiency ratio, uh, biological, like bioavailability types of stuff, biological value. There's probably the gold standard is PDCAAS, the Protein Digestibility Corrected Amino Acid Score. These are all ways to get more granulation about how good, quote unquote, a protein is uh, beyond just complete or incomplete. So um, yeah, this isn't the kind of thing that I'd be using as a protein source, but it's nice to know that in the plant kingdom, you know, this might rank pretty highly for having all, all of those nine or 10, depending on how you look at it, essential or indispensable amino acids. Uh, the thing that caught my eye is the statement from 
Kormernitsky that says quinoa is unique in being one of the few foods that are high in ectosteroids. Now, these have been sold as dietary supplements for a long time. I've worked with a couple of different pharmaceutical dietary supplement companies in the past that were selling ectosteroids, E-C-D-Y, steroid, ectosteroids. Um, and you hear all kinds of claims about energy balance and muscle growth and all this sort of stuff. I, uh, lifters haven't really reported, you know, wild gains with a Z uh, because they're using ectosteroid supplements. But if you need a, a carbohydrate source, you know, if it's more complete, it's got a better amino acid profile and it's got some ectosteroids that may help in some way. Okay. You know, I'm not opposed to some quinoa here. Um, it says, after administering the quinoa leachate uh, to nematode worms. Again, I said this was a, you know, a novel animal model. Um, he and his colleagues saw improvements in lifespan and locomotor performance. So locomotor performance, that's interesting to us, right? Neuromuscular function. Um, so lifespan and better locomotor performance. Again, in a animal model that's really not that much like people. They're going to study those worms, of course, because they don't live long like people, and you can get these sort of longevity experiments done in a timely manner. But anyway, some interesting stuff about quinoa, if that's in your cabinet, and if it's not, you might want to consider trying that as one of your sort of grain sources there. Okay, next up in my strange weekend of playing Anchorman here, we have some industry news. Um, Iron Radio specific this time. Uh, the bulking recipe contest is a go on our Iron Radio listeners Facebook page. So we have a thread set up. Uh, pictures, right? You know, people say pics or it didn't happen. So submit a, a photo of a bulking recipe, something that's very calorie and protein rich. That's about the only real rule. Uh, delicious. Uh, we'll, we're going to look at the photo. The co-host will sort of judge it on, you know, how delicious it looks and how over the top it looks, uh, things of that nature. Um, and then we want you to not just put it on our Facebook th thread, but also uh, tweet about it or put an Instagram photo up with a hashtag of Iron Radio. Uh, it helps us be aware of it and it helps spread the word about Iron Radio. So, uh, bonus points, huge bonus points if you obviously put a recipe too. You don't necessarily have to put the calorie value and all that. I mean, that would really put it over the top, you know, the protein grams and the calories. But a photo um, of something that's obviously high cal, high protein kind of food that'd be great for mass and bulking. Um, some recipe about what ingredients are used and how you might fire up the oven and how long to bake it or spray the pan or whatever it might be. Uh, in this case, it might be more like butter the pan instead of spray the pan. Uh, and then hashtag it and send it around on some social media. Um, and that's it. And then we'll take a look at the end of February and we'll see who's most ready for gains. Uh, next, uh, I just wanted to offer something. This is something just happened to me this past week. I finally got approval from administrators and the law firm on a provisional patent I'm working on. And I want to share people about this. This is not a commercial, but I'm excited about this, and I want Iron Radio listeners to know about it first. Um, but the concept is essentially, and I have to be, still be vague, but an invention that can help lifters, really anybody, but mostly lifters in our case, um, have a background level of anabolism or protein synthesis that's higher all the time. So as workouts come and go, obviously we stimulate muscle protein synthesis. This is something that can help in the background, uh, just based on your usual routine, uh, your, your your usual favorite foods and routine. You don't alter it. It's literally like a zero step process compared to your usual routine. Uh, and there's two ways that you could use this invention. One would be for to help promote muscle mass, and the other would be to help promote cognitive function. So we're just talking about curcumin and, you know, attention and memory and that sort of thing. Um, this, could, this could potentially do either. And again, on a modest background level. But I'm interested in modest background things that add up, right? I mean, your basal metabolic rate, that's, you know, your calorie output that, that runs in the background. That's by far the most of your calorie output during the day. It's not the workout. You might go through two or three or 400 calories in a workout, but you could go through many times that amount because of the background constant activity of BMR, basal metabolic rate, during the day. 
So that, again, that's just an example of how background kinds of things like this work. So I'm very excited by this and I'm gonna let you guys know uh, first, as soon as we get some of the, these um, interviews done and get the provisional patent actually squared away, uh, I want you guys to know about it. And again, always with sort of this realistic, you know, what might it do? Anyway, so uh, fun stuff happening behind the scenes from the sort of the lab and commercializing discoveries kind of aspect. Okay, there were a little bit of listener mails that I need to get to next uh, before I'll sort of address my thoughts on the topic of the day, which is making stubborn arms grow. Um, our first one here is from Rich. Rich is a longtime listener and friend of Iron Radio. He says, Lonnie, Tony Robbins is pushing this, and there's a center out in Schaumburg, Illinois, here outside Chicago. Any thoughts on this? Lots of hype behind it, but not sure how this really provides benefits. Best, Rick. So I took a look at this. It's this uh, osteo product, and I'm not going to give you the, the full name on this because, again, I don't want to make this commercial. Um, it's about loading. So it says it's not really a product. It's not really a system or a process. But honestly, it is sort of a process from what I can gather from it. Uh, it's about bone loading, and the, they're kind of marketing it as this idea that it's a place that you go to make your bones stronger. Well, it, it looks to me, and this is speculation because I'm not going to dig much further into this. It, it, it looked commercial, but I would bet it's got something to do with loading, like rapid loading. We know that bone density increases with heavy weights or rapid loading. So think like impact, maybe the legs of a volleyball player, right, as they're jumping all the time or, you know, speed work, like speed, heavy squats as fast as you can go, you know, that sort of thing. Um, in fact, I've actually had a couple of people in DEXA units looking at their bone density, including Rob Fortney, Fortress, uh, ridiculous bone density, absolutely, like 99.5th percentile bone density. So heavy weights and speed of loading, I bet it's got something to do with that. If that's true, yeah, that's kind of true, but I'm not sure why you'd have to go to like a certified person in a given location. So we'll see how that pans out, Rich. I'm, I'm not super excited that this is something uh, new, at least to the science community. Next. Neil uh, wrote in, uh, hey guys, here's something that might interest you and your listeners. Uh, I'm very interested to hear your how you weigh in on this. Talk about the bulking contest you're running. If the claims are true, I'm gonna bulk this stuff, lol. Uh, I'm going to buy some and start experimenting over the next few months. As always, keep up the good work. Uh, I've copied a bit of the expert uh, excerpt below. Um, now, this says, according to research at the Institute of Apiculture in Taranov, Russia, um, honeybee pollen may have some benefits. And I'm not going to go on. Some of what's in this clip looks a little bit commercial, again, to me and my, my salty judgment. Um, what caught my eye is not the, like the vitamins or you know minerals, that sort of thing that might be in it, but um, it's content of rutin alone could justify taking a teaspoon daily, according to these researchers, if no other reason than for strengthening your capillaries. Now, I don't know much about bee pollen, except that over the decades, and I mean decades, it has come and gone. It's always sort of popping up among the, in my opinion, the hippy dippy kinds of, uh, you know, fringes of nutrition. Uh, rutin is a bioflavonoid, um, there is some information out there that some of these phytochemicals, plant chemicals, might uh, enhance vascular function in different ways. Uh, I don't know, bee pollen may be a, a, a richer source of very particular ones. Um, really don't know. I can't say I'm super excited about bee pollen. Uh, there's lots of stuff about vascular function and blood flow and that sort of thing. We were talking about it just the other week. Uh, honestly, things like massage and heat kinds of therapies uh, maybe just as effective. I, nutritionally, I've always been a fan of just getting some insulin surge with like whey protein and, and a banana, you know, in a shake. Uh, that'll get your insulin rocking uh, and that'll open up vascular beds. So, and, and at the same time, it's going to provide, you know, all the essential amino acids from the whey. Uh, you know, um, Neil, if you're excited about it, interesting, you know, let us know what you think. Uh, like I said, I, I'm not... 
it's one of those things. I'm not going to say there's no science on it, but it's one of those things that's never really come to the forefront uh, in a lot of like academic nutrition circles. Uh, and that suggests to me that there may be some reasons for that. Sometimes you'll see uh, Eastern Bloc data that just never translates over I into Western science. That doesn't mean it's wrong. It just means sometimes it's harder to verify, and it just has that sort of esoteric, distant feel to it that's hard to capitalize on. Would I buy bee pollen? No, I probably wouldn't. There's a lot of other bang-for-the-buck kinds of things that I would be doing. Um, but... Anyway, interesting, and uh, Neil, you did bring up the contest. Honestly, uh, a high-end <laughs> calorie meal, um, that's going to do a lot for your insulin and your blood flow and that kind of stuff too as far as physically active lifters go. So uh, I look forward to your submission uh, on that. Finally, we got a nice email from Arturo. He says, thanks again. You guys are awesome. I didn't expect to get what amounted to be free coaching consult from some of the best fitness guys in the podcast realm. You have a lifelong fan. Thanks, man. That is well appreciated. That's one of the try things that we try to do, right, is give back. And we have different perspectives, right? I'm, you know, I'm a professor, and Dr. Nelson is actually very similar flavor but works with clients directly. Phil is a gym owner and very specific to strength. You know, my background is bodybuilding competitions that those guys haven't done. So we do try to bring things from a varied perspective and – and bring in evidence when we can. And yes, we do speculate sometimes and give opinions, but we usually say, hey, this is speculation. That's fine. So um, thanks again for that email. Uh, cool stuff and glad to have you on board, my man. All right, so that's enough of my caffeine-fueled sermon. Uh, we're going to go to break, and when we come back, I'm going to discuss uh, some of my thoughts because I'm running solo here, Anchorman Lonnie, um, on making stubborn arms grow. Hey listeners, this is Dr. Lonnie Lowry. If you've ever had anyone critique you uh, on your protein intake as part of your weightlifting lifestyle, oh, you poor meathead, all that extra protein is going to rot your kidneys or weaken your bones or dehydrate you or give you gout or who knows what. Uh, there is a book available. You could simply Google CRC Press and Lowry. And what I've done is reach out to experts all over the world and create a book, a single compendium that you can hold up and say, this is why I consume extra protein. This can be very valuable when you're um, being quote unquote educated uh, by various professionals on the topic. Uh, there's enormous amount of literature in this book on the safety, uh, the effectiveness, how protein works in cells, the history of protein and weight trainers, uh, much more. So again, please check out CRC Press and Protein and Lowry. You can just Google that, and uh, I do, full disclosure, I do make a small single-digit royalty on the book, but that's not why I did it. I did it so we can all have something, uh, our particular population, uh, to both defend what we do and to inform our nutrition and our eating. Thanks. Iron Radio is, of course, primarily a podcast. But over the years, there have been technical glitches calling for backup streaming and listeners who wanted the convenience of other sources of audio content. Toward this end, Iron Radio is now simulcast and backed up on YouTube. If needed, please search Lawnman07 or Iron Radio from within YouTube. There's not much video, but if you like to listen through YouTube on a Roku or other living room device, there you go. Like your weekly fix of Iron Radio? In addition to being a popular institute on iTunes, we are also on email. Simply go to www.ironradio.org and sign up for the voluntary email. You'll get a once per week email, no more, that's little more than the show notes and a link to the audio. So go for it. <laughs> All right, welcome back. We are going to discuss a few um, ideas that might help you if you want bigger arms. I think most people probably do. Uh, but I'll, again, I mentioned before, a lot of times you actually have, I know some power lifters who they don't even do direct arm work because they figure the heavy benching handles the triceps, you know, things of that nature. 
uh, heavy pulls, work your biceps, that sort of thing. Um, I personally have always felt that some direct arm work is important. I don't do as many sets as I used to, but we'll talk about uh, some of these things, the volume requirements, uh, the different movements, uh, things like that. Now, if you're like, well, forget the science, Lowry, what's the street cred? Well, I have had arms that were mm, almost 19 inches in the past. I, I know that's not like pro quality, but, you know, 18 and a half to 19 inch arms before, I've got them to grow pretty good. Now, in my post-competitive years, I've noticed my arms, I have to get comfortable with them being a little bit smaller, but I've actually noticed as I've gotten older, it's some of the, what I would call accessory muscles and not just the biceps itself uh, that has actually atrophied a little. So th let me start there. That's one of the things that you can focus on if you want big arms. Well, first of all, your triceps is a larger part of your upper arm than the biceps, right? But we can't forget those underlying and associated muscles uh, but beneath and just distal, if you will, uh, downstream from your biceps, the brachialis and brachioradialis. And for those sorts of things, uh, you could do a, a, some interesting things like um, hammer curls, right? So where you supinate partly and you're doing curls, not with the, your palm directly up, but uh, imagine like if you both the arms were in front of you, your palms would be facing each other, right? And I know a lot of you guys are like, duh, Lowry, we know what hammer curls are. But again, that's very interesting stuff. I also like Scott curls or preacher curls because they get the humerus, they get the upper arm out in front of you, right? So you get that anterior kind of uh, flexion of the upper arm and that puts it in a position that puts more uh, stress, if you will, stimulus on the lower parts of the biceps and the upper portion of the forearm where it connects with your upper arm. So I'm actually a huge fan of including some hammer curls and Scott curls. I've actually noticed when I've had elbow problems, uh, I can actually get away with doing preacher curls or Scott curls with fairly heavy weight and not be bothered if the machine is just right. I bet a lot of you noticed that before. If you do direct arm work and if you use a, a, a preacher bench, it really depends on the, the steepness of, of the platform, right, that you're resting your, your triceps against, so to speak. Um, so one, would, one of my tips would be focus on those other muscles on the anterior part of the arm, the brachialis and brachioradialis, again, with things like hammer curls, uh, Scott curls, things like that. I've also seen data in the past, and this is a whirlwind tour, so I'm not going to reference a lot of things here, but that the speed at which you do preacher curls uh, matters in the amount of like um, stimulation, right? Electrical stimulation of some of these muscle groups. So I would suggest differences in cadence. If you are stuck and you're in a rut and all you do is slow negatives, you might wanna try some a little bit faster. Now, you have to be careful with something like a preacher curl. You don't want to pop a bicep. I actually knew somebody who uh, blew a bicep, tore his biceps because he was doing very ballistic, bouncing kind of uh, preacher curls with, uh, with more speed. So you got to be careful in the very low end of the movement if you're going to do it faster. But again, rep cadence could be something that could break up the monotony and bring you some new growth. Another way to look at it, almost a flip side of bringing your humerus out in front of you for something like Scott curls, or even if you do freestanding dumbbell curls or hammer curls, right? You could bring your arm out in front of you a little bit before you start to flex your biceps, um, flex your you know forearm. So you kind of swing the elbow out first, then bring it up. Um, but in addition to that, again, flip side might be what I call profanity curls. And I call them this for a reason. Some of you have heard me talk about this before. Um, lying on an inclined bench and you let your humerus drift, your upper arm bone, drift behind you a little bit. Imagine as you're laying on the bench, you know, you let your arms dangle straight down from gravity um, with a, you know, medium kind of weight dumbbell, maybe a 40 pound dumbbell, depends on your strength, of course. Um, that puts the biceps in a stretched position. I think working muscles in a stretched position, again, you have to be very cautious, but doing negatives or working them in a stretched position really turns on growth. Um, so profanity curls essentially uh, just involve bringing the, the dumbbells, you're using dumbbells here, you're bringing them up uh, by your shoulders and then you do a four count down, one 1,000, two 1,000, three 1,000, four 1,000, 
um, you do about six to eight reps of that with the right weight and your arms are on fire but you keep going you know so you really need to push into that eight rep range nine ten rep range um that has i've seen that work for myself and for different lifters who are had very stubborn arms eccentric contractions like that right slow lowering movement it does a lot of micro trauma i've got some great slides um, that I show students sometimes of what sore muscles look like under a microscope. They're really pretty scrambled and it causes a lot of remodeling and growth. So um, eccentric stuff. And again, with, in, this, in this case with your, your upper arm uh, behind your torso, right? As your arms are hanging down, that, wow, uh, sore. Uh, if you can get yourself sore, that means you've done a fair amount of eccentric, like, you know, that DOMS, delayed onset muscle soreness. You've done a fair amount of that eccentric micro trauma, and that's going to cause some growth. So if all you do is standard, you know, uh, straight sets, three sets of 10 with dumbbells or barbells, and your arms aren't going anywhere, consider profanity curls. Uh, three or four sets of those. I don't think I would start with four, uh, but, but it depends on how, how much mind in the muscle you've got going on and how slow that you're lowering it. But um, yeah, um, I, some, I used to call them profane train curls or profanity because you're just chugging along going, God, you know, you F it. And it's it brutal. They're brutal. It's like a shock treatment. I wouldn't do that all the time. Uh, but I knew one guy in particular, Scott, and um, he had always had problems with his upper arms. He was very thick, the chest and traps, and his arms just weren't where he wanted. He was a competitive bodybuilder. And um, that's something that, can be very helpful. You know, worked for me, worked for him, worked for quite a few people actually that I've, I've talked to different kinds of negatives like that. Uh, negatives, by the way, are also something that you could employ with preacher curls. And again, just being careful at the end of the movement. I'm not talking about using like 120% of your max super heavy negatives, but pretty heavy, you know, but focusing on that four count lower movement with something that you might barely be able to get eight reps with, something like that. Uh, what else do we have? Uh, well, we've got the upper, uh, the back of the upper arm, of course, triceps. This is my bias, but hit heads or skull crushers, lying triceps extensions, whatever you want to call them, I feel like that is the squat of the upper arm. You could do kickbacks till you know you're blue in the face, or even push downs. You know, they're, push downs aren't useless, but uh, hit heads. And again, because you can, you can let your upper arm drift imagine like if you're in a lying position you're holding the uh, an easy curl bar against your forehead you can let that drift up above your head so you get some extra stretch and what are we doing again we're working a muscle in a slightly stretched position not to the point that it's it's like a, a pullover but you you get that extra stretch in your triceps so you're not always going just straight to your forehead but you're letting it go drift above your head as you let the weight pull down in the bottom of the uh, hit head movement. Uh, wow. Uh, lots of growth. Just lots of growth. Now, those are hard on your elbows. Uh, I, I've had tendonitis to the point I even, my right triceps tendon even pulled right off the olecranon, right off my arm, uh, elbow bone, if you will, um, at one point, m late career kinds of stuff. But that's because I was being, frankly, stupid. I had more weight than I sh probably should have been using. I think I had like 135, 140 pounds on that easy curl bar. And, you know, that's a, it's sort of an isolation movement and your elbows are in a very precarious position. So if you have bad elbows, you got to be really careful with the hit heads or the skull crushers. But I always try to find a way to use them because anytime I'm, I'm managing soreness, you know, uh, tendonitis and that sort of thing. Um, and I'm back to doing that, actually. I'm, I'm just smarter in how I go about it because it'll cause some of that soreness. You can use a, a reasonable amount of weight. Uh, again, just easy curl bar, a little extra stretch in the bottom of the movement with those hit heads. Damn. Um, so something to think about as far as triceps go. And the last thing I'm going to share is really a vanity thing with bodybuilders, but uh, that's achieving a certain amount of leanness. If your arms are leaner, they look bigger. If your arm just looks like a cylinder from your shoulder to your wrist, even if it's a 20-inch arm, it's not going to look as dramatic as if you're lean enough to see the separation between your deltoids and your biceps and triceps, for example, right? There's even that cephalic vein or the um, 
even the accessory cephalic vein that run, runs down the outer edge, you know, that big showy vein on your biceps. Uh, I once had a guy say, I want that. How do I get that? Uh, which I think is kind of funny and kind of vain, but oh, no pun intended. But you get the, the point is if you're lean enough, your arms look much bigger. And you might have even had somebody say that to you in the, in the past. Like, you know, your, act, your arm might actually be half an inch smaller, but people are making comments about how big your arms look because they're very vascular and they're lean enough that you could see the separation of some of those muscles. So those are my, really my best tips, right? If you've got stubborn arms and you're trying to get them to grow, uh, profanity curls, uh, working uh, biceps and triceps in slightly stretched positions like that, or even with hit heads, as I mentioned, or skull crushers, uh, focus on the brachialis and brachioradialis, change the tempo or the speed of the contraction, um, and get a little bit leaner if you have to. Uh, those are things that might, you know, just give you some ideas in your training this week so you can be proud as the weather starts to warm up in coming months and you can kind of show off your guns. That's going to be it for this week. Thanks for listening to Anchorman Lonnie, uh, but the show must go on. We'll see you next time. Hey, listeners. Have you seen the store at ironradio.org? There are three halls in the store, one for Phil, one for Fortress, and one for myself, Dr. Lowry, and they're thematic. So you can go into our Halls of Iron store and choose based on your goal if you need something to learn or read or something nutritional you can look in my store uh, Lonnie's store if you want something about injury prevention uh, or competition then take a look at Phil's Hall of Iron and if you want something about motivation or daily training Fortress's Hall has what you're looking for there are some fun heroic descriptors uh, as you browse through the stores. We try to make it a little more fun than the average boring online store. And whether you're a novice lifter or someone more experienced, you can take heart that you're not wasting your time. The things that we put in each hall of iron are actually based on our own recommendations. Protein powders that we know to be good, uh, knee sleeves, wraps of some kind, things that Fortress uses in his own training. Uh, the stuff you, you see, you know is good. This way you don't waste time. So check out the Iron Radio store at ironradio.org. And um, let us know what you think on the forums. And certainly you can request products and we will uh, screen them before they go in. So thanks for listening. Iron Radio is accepting donations. If you like what we do, the professors, the scientists, the bodybuilding show promoters, the athletes themselves in powerlifting and bodybuilding, um, please consider making a donation or maybe buying something from the ironradio.org uh, store. Uh, we also are accepting supporting members. So for $4 a month, which is frankly less than the bank sneaks out of your account in fees, you can step up and support a form of sort of public radio for the bodybuilding and powerlifting and strength community. The Iron Radio Podcast and all of the audio on ironradio.org is for informational purposes only. If you're interested in starting a diet or exercise program, it's important to check with your physician. Also seek the help of registered dietitians, athletic trainers, and qualified exercise physiologists in order to make the progress that you need.